So we recently discussed text classification. Now we're going to switch to a slightly related topic in information retrieval, specifically text clustering. So what is the difference between text classification and text clustering? In text classification, we know in advance what sort of classes we're looking for, whether they're uh, overlapping or not, whether they're hierarchical or not. However, in text clustering, we don't know that in advance. We have to figure out, first of all, how many clusters there are in the data, and then decide which documents go to in each cluster. So in clustering, we also have this issue of exclusive versus overlapping clusters. So a document in the first case uh, may only be assigned to one cluster. In the second case, it may be assigned to multiple clusters. And we can also have the dis same distinction as in classification between hierarchical and flat clustering. So in information retrieval, there is this uh, very important uh, principle called the cluster hypothesis that says that documents in the same cluster are usually relevant to the same query. So if somehow several documents are similar to each other and one of them is relevant to a particular query, that means that the rest of the documents in the cluster are also expected to be relevant to it. So how do we do this in practice? Now let's look at an example. So this is a Clusty. It uh, is a, an old information retrieval system that uh, clusters documents based on word senses. So the word here is Jaguar. Jaguar is obviously an ambiguous word in English. It can correspond to a sports team, to a car, to an animal, and to several other things. So the idea here is that uh, when the search engine retrieves all the documents that match Jaguar, it looks at how similar they are to each other, and then it tries to identify all the clusters that correspond to the different word senses of Jaguar without knowing in advance that Jaguar is ambiguous or that knowing that it has a certain number of of senses. So you, it gives you one cluster for cars, one cluster for animals, and so on. So one of the simplest techniques for uh, document clustering is the so-called k-means method. It's done by iteratively determining which cluster a point belongs to, and then adjusting the cluster centroid for that cluster, and then repeat. So what is needed, however, is to know the number of clusters in advance, k. And k-means is based on hard decisions. So once a document is assigned to a certain cluster, it can only be there. It cannot change clusters, and it cannot be assigned to another cluster simultaneously. So here's the algorithm. We initialize the cluster centroids for the k cluster to some arbitrary vector. And then, while further improvement is possible, we do the following. For each document d, we find which cluster is closest to the document d. And then we assign this document to the cluster c. And then for each cluster C, we recompute the centroid of cluster C based on its documents. And that's it. Okay, so let's look at an example for uh, k-means clustering. We have k equals 2, and we have six vectors that we want to classify into those two clusters. So the documents are 1, 6, 2, 2, 4, 0, 3, 3, 2, 5, and 2, 1. As I said before, we can assign arbitrary values to the cluster centroids at the beginning. Let's make it simple. We are going to have class 0 labeled as uh, 0, 0. That would be the centroid for that class. And class 1 having a centroid at 6, 6. So it will be much easier to compute the distances from each of those vectors to the centroids in our heads. So let's look at document A. Is it closer to 0, 0 or to 6, 6? Well, it should be pretty obvious that based on both Euclidean and Manhattan distance that it belongs to the second cluster, 6, 6. Document B uh, with a value of 2, 2 is going to be closer to centroid 0, 0. C is also going to be closer to 0, 0. Now, D is an interesting example because it's right in the middle between the two centroids, so we cannot really use it in this round. We can ignore it. E, 2, 5 is closer to 6, 6 than to 0, 0. And finally, F, uh, 2.1, is closer to 0, 0 than to 6, 6. So what happens after the first half of the first iteration is that out of the six documents, we have uh, labeled five of them one way or the other. And specifically, documents B, C, and F belong to the cluster at centered at 0, 0. And documents A and E belong to the second uh, cluster. So now we can do the second part of the first iteration, namely recomputing the centroids. So uh, let's do this for the cluster that used to be 0, 0. So now it includes 2, 2, 4, 0, and 2, 1. So the new centroid is just going to be the average of those vectors. So 2 plus 4 plus 2 is equal to 8 divided by 3, so 8 thirds for the first dimension. And then for the second dimension, 2 plus 0 plus 1, so 3 divided by 3, or 1 for the second dimension. So we have essentially 
two and two thirds comma one as the new centoid for the first cluster. Now the second cluster, the one that used to be at six six, is going to be computed as follows. We have to take the average of one six and two five. So the first dimension is going to be at 1.5 and the second dimension is going to be at 5.5. So those are now the two new centroids after the first full iteration. And now we can repeat the same procedure by reassigning each of those documents A, B, C, D, E, F to one of those two clusters. And then recomputing the centroids again and we have to repeat this uh, sequence of iterations as many times as necessary until the centroids converge. What that means is that the moment that the two centroids don't change from one iteration to the next, uh, we can stop because they're never going to change from that point on. So there are some websites that have interesting demos of k-means. Uh, so one is uh, here, and the second one, third one, fourth one. So I would like to encourage you to look at those tutorials and understand k-means a little bit better. So how do we evaluate clustering? So again, in all the cases that we had so far, we assume that we know in advance the number of clusters. Uh, one important thing to realize is that if we don't know the number of clusters, we essentially have to do the following. We can try different values for k and then figure out which of those clusterings gives us better performance. So here's one way to evaluate the performance of clustering. Uh, the first technique that we're going to introduce is called purity and it is based on the majority class of each, in each of the clusters. And the second one is the so-called RAND index, which is going to be shown on the next slide. So let's look at purity first. We have three clusters. The first one has three X's and two circles. The second one has three circles, one X and one percent. And the last one has four percents and two X's. So how pure are those clusters? Well, the first cluster, the majority class is X and three out of five elements in that cluster are X's, therefore its purity is 60%. The second cluster has the same value, three circles out of five for the majority class, again, a purity of 60%. And finally, the last cluster, we have four out of six, or 67% for the majority class of percent. And then we can take the average of those over the entire set and compute the overall purity. So this is three plus three plus four divided by 16, which is the total number of elements that we clustered. And that gives us a total purity of 62.5%. Obviously, if we had uh, the first cluster consisting only of X's, the second cluster consisting only of circles, and the third one consisting only of percents, we would get a purity of 100%. So the next metric that is used in evaluating clustering is the so-called RAND index. So RAND index is based on uh, the following principle. We, we're going to score points every time we get two objects that really belong to the same class uh, labeled together in the same cluster. And we're going to lose points every time we have, again, two objects that should be in the same cluster and we label them in different clusters. So the RAND index value is equal to the number of true positives plus the number of true negatives divided by the total number of all the pairs of objects. So here's an example using the same example as on the previous slide. The number of true positives and the number of false positives together, in the first example, we have five total objects. There's five choose two pairs of those five objects. So that gives us uh, 10. We also have five choose two pairs for the second cluster, so another 10. And finally, we have six choose two cluster, uh, pairs in the third cluster for 15. So the total number of positives is 35. Those are the things that we are supposed to get into the same cluster. Now we can similarly compute the number of true positives separately. So in the first case, we have three X's. So three choose two is equal to six. Uh, and then the same thing for the next cluster, three choose two. And the final cluster, we have both two different kinds of uh, objects that uh, appear together. So first one appears four times. So we have four choose two. And the last one, there are only two. So we pick two choose two. So the sum of those for uh, terms is equal to 13. So the number of false positives is equal to the first number minus the second number, or 35 minus 13, which is equal to 22. So this gives us two of the cells in the contingency table, specifically two positive and false positive. We can use the same math to compute the false negatives, which are 21, and the two negatives, which are 64. And now we can compute the RAND index. It's again two positives plus two negatives by, by the total number, or 13 plus 64 divided by 120, which is equal to 0 0.64. So again, this is a moderately 
good agreement of the clustering algorithm. If we had everything correctly clustered, the exact same as in the gold standard, the RAND index is going to be equal to one because we're only going to have two positives and two negatives and none of the other two categories. So there are uh, other methods for clustering that are specifically designated for hierarchical clustering. Everything that we looked at so far was mostly for flat clustering. So one of the techniques that is used is the so-called single linkage method. In single linkage, you take two objects, you figure out how similar they are to each other, and if you think that they're similar enough, you put them in the same cluster. So and then to collapse two clusters, you have to figure out if there's even one pair of documents that are close enough to each other, you're going to merge the two clusters. So this has disadvantages that you can get very long chains of uh, documents that are not even related to each other. They're just pairwise related, but the first one is very different from the last one, and you still have them in the same cluster. So another method is the so-called complete linkage method, in which case, in order to merge two clusters, we have to consider all the pairs of documents where one is in one cluster and one is in the other cluster, and if they're similar enough to each other, then we merge the two clusters. One disadvantage of this method is that it is too conservative. And finally, we can have something called an average linkage method, which is based on uh, the average similarity of objects in the two clusters. So let's look at an example here. Suppose that those are our documents. We're going to start by collapsing together the documents that are most similar to each other. So for example, one and two in the same cluster, three and four in the same cluster, five and six in the same cluster, and then seven and eight in the same cluster. So now at this point, we're going to have four clusters of two documents. And then in this case, depending on the algorithm, we would either merge one, two with three, four, and five, six with seven, eight, or we would merge one, two, five, six, and three, four, seven, eight. And then at the last step of the hierarchical clustering process, we're going to merge the two remaining clusters into one. So at the very end, we're going to have one big cluster that includes all of the eight documents, and then two subclusters that include four documents each, and then finally those four are going to be grouped into groups of two. So let's look at an example of hierarchical agglomerative clustering using a dendrogram. So a dendrogram is a technique that uh, builds uh, a hierarchical structure based on similarity. So here's an example from language similarity. We have uh, five, uh, six Germanic languages, Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, Dutch, and German, and we want to measure how similar they are based on the use of different uh, words. So in this case, it turns out that Norwegian and Swedish are more similar to each other at around 0 0.12. So we're going to cluster them together at that level. Then that new cluster, Norwegian, Swedish, is going to be merged with the cluster for Danish at 0 0.16. Then Dutch and German are similar to each other about 0 0.29, so they're going to be clustered together there. Then the group that consists of Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish is going to be merged with Icelandic at around 0 0.36. And finally, the two remaining clusters are going to be clustered at 0 0.7 uh, into the whole collection. So this gives us a very nice representation, which um, allows us to produce any number of clusters. So if we start from the right-hand side and you move a vertical bar to the left, if that bar is at, let's say, 0 0.8, we just say that we have one cluster. If we lower it at 0 0.5, then it's going to cause the two horizontal lines that are at 0 0.5. We're going to have a Nordic group of four languages and another group of two languages. Then if we slide this vertical bar again to, let's say, 0 0.25, we're going to get four clusters. And if we sl slide it all the way down to 0 0.1, we're going to get six clusters. So an example of this is shown at the website below. So let's now look at an example for clustering using dendrograms. Suppose that you have the following sentences or following documents. The first one is A, B, C, B, A. The next one is A, D, C, C, A, D, E, and so on. And we want to build a hierarchical clustering uh, uh, diagram using dendrograms. So what do we need to do? We have to compute the pairwise similarities between uh, all the pairs of uh, documents, so one to two, one to three, one to four, and so on. We identify the closest pair. So in this case, that could be, for example, document one and document two. And now we have to merge them into a single node based on the frequencies of the words that appear in the two documents combined. And then we repeat this until all the documents have been clustered. And we can also represent this as a Venn diagram where depending on the similarity metric, we may get something like 
the first document and the second document in one cluster, the fourth and the fifth one in another cluster, then the fourth and the fifth combined with the third one in another cluster, and then all five in another cluster. So this concludes the section on text clustering. Uh, we're going to continue with a different topic.